Names bound battle. Hugo my battle. And don't forget to like this video. Okay, darling? Cool pit. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Today, another Omega Seamaster unboxing. I know there has been a lot uh, over the years. It is a watch I've owned countless versions of. Um, however, and I have to state, I did not intend on um, purchasing this particular watch. I should explain, I'm also not really trying to buy anything. That's why I haven't been doing my uh, usual amount of unboxings. Priorities have uh, changed. I've, I've already talked about that. I, I'm sure a lot of you are probably um, trying to save money as well. I do, however, have a kind of list in my mind of watches that I look out for. Certain Amigas, the Navi Timer, obviously, uh, if I see the right one at the right price, etc. Certain Seikos, Grand Seiko especially, and obviously rarer G-Shocks, and the occasional Casio that's been forgotten about, little hidden lost gems with unusual complications. This kind of stuff I'm always on the lookout for. I enjoy the hunt, you know, I can't really um, step away from it. It's just part of the, the enjoyment of the, the hobby. I don't know, perhaps you are like this, perhaps you aren't. Um, do you guys experience the same thing? Please do share down below. But anyway, let's change perspective. Let's take it to the light box and then I wanna come back and, and just explain a little bit why I went for this particular era. Now, this has come from Japan, again, as always, and uh, I should really say that if you're buying Brightlings, Omegas, uh, occasionally Rolex, definitely Tudor, those kind of like mid-level luxury brands, the Japanese market is just absolutely chock-a-block with bargains. And I'll do a knife check. As, as, as we're not really doing <laughs> wristwatch checks, I'll do a knife check. Yes, old Benchy, the Benchmade, Benchmark, whatever the hell it is. It's Benchmade, yeah. Uh, old Benchy is back. Let's get on with it. I also have to point out this arrived and was shipped like lightning. Let's make the first incision. You can tell my dad was a surgeon. <laughs> no, seriously, he was. So that's why I always say that. But anyway, there we go. Second incision. There we go. Box within a box within a box within a box. Open beautifully wrapped. Uh, I was really impressed how quick this was, I have to say, because considering, you know, the, the, the mess that certain international mail is in right now, this arrived literally within a few days. I mean, DHL did a smashing job. Uh, shipping it in. So what's it say? Thank you for your purchase. Blah, 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 blah. I am very nervous about this because the price was so ridiculously low. The feedback wasn't great on the account of the, the, the seller. And on top of that, the pictures weren't amazing, but I, I took a gamble. So it could either really go both ways. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Right. Moment of truth. Drum roll, please. Oh, I see it. I see it. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, wow. Here we go. This I think this is 1958. Oh, look at the dial. Oh, the dial is untouched. Lots of natural patina. Now, you'll notice the beads of rice bracelet. A lot of the gold has worn off. I didn't buy it for the bracelet. Oh, look. I wonder if you can see. Oh, there's me. There's me. Hello. Hello behind the camera. Uh, but it is original. Um, where it should be original. I didn't buy it for the bracelet. I'm probably going to take this bracelet off. It's gold capped. Now, the, the listing said gold plated, but of course, they didn't do gold plated with this particular model. Uh, it was gold capped. Now, gold capped is slightly better, in my opinion, because what it is, it's a surface added to the base metal. Now, it can come off, but it's thicker and doesn't wear off as easily as gold plating, which I think gold plating, pretty sure, came later. Correct me if I'm wrong, but what I was really looking at was the head of the watch, the case. Had any of these surfaces come loose or, or was exposing the, the steel beneath? And it looks in pretty good shape. There is a bit of, you know, obviously there's a lot of scratches and stuff, but what, I'm, what I was looking for was this configuration, this particular caliber, the 500, and then I'll, I'll get into why this is such an important era. Um, let me just clear this all out of the way, sorry. 
why this is in such a important era. Um, it is automatic, but of course we've got manual wind. Oh, very, very satisfying. Beautiful little 34 millimeter size. So it's gonna fit me like an absolute glove. Look at that. Oh my God. I'm gonna take the bracelet off and I'm going to pop it on a beautiful strap, maybe a distressed collarable, something like that. Actually, even maybe an ostrich. Look at that patina. Applied logo. This is one of the last great Seamasters or generations of Seamaster before the big change in 57. Pie pan as well. Not like, not as uh, exaggerated like the, the uh, constellations, but um, definitely has that edge and no painting or repainting of the dial. All, all original, so really chuffed. And I love those faceted hour markers. So far, an absolute success. Yes, it is very, very used, but uh, I might as well tell you, I spent uh, <laughs> 700 bucks. I think 750 for this is just an amazing deal. I could not let it go, you know, when we have the hippocampus on the back. Anyway, let's give it 24 hours. Let's take it back to the studio, possibly my last Seamaster. Now, to get it into perspective, and I've written a list here uh, of all the Amigas I own. So the very first one, and this is, this is actually my first luxury watch. So my connection with Amiga is very, very strong here. It was the mid-size 300 meter auto, the smaller version of the Pierce Brosnan uh, Bond watch, famously worn by Prince William, given to him by uh, the late great Princess Diana. Then I graduated, so to speak. I was a larger chap back then, so I could pull it off. It was the chronograph version, basically a Valju 7750 based, really cracking watch, extremely solid. And this was the second generation with the applied logo, with the more finessed dial. The first generation had printing only. I went back to the full size quartz, very, very classic. Then I went automatic. <laughs> Yeah, it was the Brosnan, the GoldenEye, the official GoldenEye. And it was a real momentous occasion for me because I remember playing GoldenEye, the game, on the N64. I've talked about this before. I'm sure a lot of you are the same. And it just takes me back to that age. And I hadn't really experienced a, a luxury watch before. It's, it's beautiful craftsmanship, it's curves, that scallop bezel. It was a bit of a grail watch, I have to, to say. And back then you could get them under $2,000. It was crazy. Then I went vintage, probably the worst Seamaster I ever owned, and it was the 1000 caliber, which is notorious. The whole 70s era for, for Amiga was a little bit shaky. They uh, were dealing with the fallout from the quartz crisis. They overinvested in the development of the Plo Prof, these kind of watches, which are very, very expensive at a time when you really need to tighten the belt, so to speak. The result was a, a, a kind of rushed 1000 caliber that family that I think it's the fourth generation of in-house calibers from Amiga. Then I had the, the pregenitor of the, the baby plow prof, you could say, some, some call it. And that was the 120 meter diver with this kind of tonneau shape case, beautiful spider dial. And then of course I came back to the modern 300. I went coaxial, escapement, I wanted to experience it cracking watch. This was before they reinvented it more recently with the etch dial. Uh, so where am I now? The Dunkirk movie came out. My love affair with the Seamaster line kind of ended and I went back to the uh, watches before then from World War II. They were really the genesis of what was to later become uh, Seamaster, the 30T2 based movements, which are incredibly tough, proven in war, as the beautiful Christopher Nolan film perfectly demonstrates with Tom Hardy's character. Yeah, that was the Weems style pilot's watch, but I had the Spitfire. There was an era I hadn't experienced, and this was the 50s. And why is the 50s so crucial to Amiga? Well, it was the pinnacle of their movement manufacturing. The 500 series that this watch has, by the way, I've put it on a lovely strap here. I didn't buy it for the bracelet. I wanted it as a kind of everyday dressy piece. And I have to say also, it's it's really, it's keeping great time. I cannot believe I spent 750 bucks, fully automatic because, and when I mean fully automatic, of course, the early generation was bumper. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, but it's basically, instead of the rotor going all the way around, it bounces off a spring, goes back and forth. This is before they had perfected the rotor mounted uh, and could rotate 360 degrees. Charmingly referred to often as the fat lugged 
uh, scene master. It's very dressy. And then, of course, in 1957, the trilogy came out and changed scene master irrevocably forever into a professional dive watch. And these dressy pieces, with the exception of some Seamaster uh, Genève's kind of hybrid, it went into the diving world. Amiga really wanted to compete with Rolex. The 300 was issued to the Royal Navy, which in turn inspired Rolex again, this kind of cat and mouse game rivalry between the two greats. Rolex, of course, coming out with their meal subs, even mimicking Amiga with the hash marks and the wide sword hands, etc., etc. I realize I haven't even done wristwatch check. That's terrible. Babbling, I'm so excited about this watch. I haven't done wristwatch check. Okay, so I'm wearing the Explorer, talking of Bond, and I'm wearing it on the El Alamein, which I give a shout out to Risk County Watch Club. I actually designed this strap. It's, the colors are inspired by uh, the uniforms worn by my ancestors at the Battle of El Alamein in North Africa. So a little tribute. All the straps I designed, there's always a military theme because of course I come from a military family. There was the Valor inspired by another ancestors, Victoria Cross, etc, etc, etc. So this time it's World War II rather than World War I, um, but perfectly suited, of course, to the old Fleming, the Explorer, my favorite watch. There we go. Anyway, wristwatch check done. Let's get back to it, shall we? Now, Seamaster was Amiga's longest running line. It was released in 1948 to commemorate the 100 years of the brand. When I reviewed the Planet Ocean, the 39mm, doing the history section, I, I began to realize just how integral they are to the history of, of even before dive watches or, or what, when watches became dive watches the early marine watch of, of the 30s, this kind of thing, and their involvement since the turn of the century with the British. Their history with military involvement far precedes Rolex. And then, of course, you have this great age that gave birth to the most influential Seamaster, the Railmaster, the uh, Speedmaster in 57, which this was during that, that period. And I have to say, as I... The winding sound is, is really, I absolutely love this one. The size is perfect. I'm getting distracted by the watch. I really wanted the crosshair dial, so, uh, and, and the way the little multifaceted hour markers glisten in the light, utterly bewitching. Anyway, sorry, get to, yeah, I'm trying to justify my, my, my purchase here. We're talking about the, 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 the peak, the golden era of, of Amiga, and this is still a soft spot. You can still find these bargains. I had, my eye on a constellation, of course, another watch that was born in the 50s, in 1952. They were the higher end chronometer level, kind of luxury line. Of course, they're much more expensive. And typically they do have the 500 series, this third generation of automatic movements, but you're looking at more the high end, the 504, the 505 which are chronometer level. They added a, a more advanced winding system. They were greatly improved. That beautiful swan neck regulator, these kind of rock, rock solid movements. Okay, it's not the fastest beating movement. We're talking about 19,800 vibrations an hour. The, the power reserve, I haven't really clocked it yet. You could probably find this information online. The fact it was made start to finish in-house completely by Amiga, by a, a heritage brand, and it's got a timeless elegance to it. And I used this word uh, the other day. What was I using? I was, I was using it in the Sopranos video. Very similitude. I love that word because it has that. It, there's an honesty to it. And I think it encapsulates that age. The best of Amiga. What can you say about Amiga now? I still love Amiga. But why am I lusting after these older ones? Why have these got magic that the contemporary versions don't? I did a whole video discussing why I fell out of love with the Speedmaster. Don't get me wrong, I love the Speedmaster. Always will. If you if you pan over there, you see the um, <clears throat> excuse me, you see the the poster. I'm not knocking the heritage, but for me, the Seamaster I think is the best. Okay, they didn't go to the moon, but they're on James Bond's wrist the longest running line. Uh, they have the most, if you look at the history, how it turned from a dress watch and then into this military diver, then this saturation diver, the Plo Prof. You don't get the same amount of variety with any other line of watches. I don't think in any other brand. From this little elegant Mad esque dress watch to a Plo Prof, which is literally a submarine tank. It's incredible. I'd love to know what your favorite Seamaster is. Uh, what are you lusting after? What little bargains? This is another pickup from the Japanese eBay market. I'm still finding gems. I have to say this though, it's getting harder to find clean dials that have not been repainted. 
and I cannot stress that enough. I was very lucky to find an entirely original. Yes, the, um, the bracelet is, for lack of a better expression, uh, cream crackered. I said to myself, even if it doesn't perform and it's keeping an impeccable time. Okay, it's not cost accurate, but look, it's what, 60, 70 years old, right? I think I can be a little lenient on it. And even if it hadn't been serviced or it needed the service, I know the parts are there. I've had watches from this era serviced before. They're not the most expensive. Um, there's still a lot of spare parts from a, a good, reputable watchmaker. I have my guys at um, uh, Saltzman's, of course, God, I nearly forgot their name. Saltzman's, they've serviced many ETAs, Tudors, Amigas for me. No problem, I know they can find the parts. Even if it needed the service, which would be what? A couple of hundred bucks, we're still at the thousand dollar, just over a thousand dollar mark. So there we go. Um, I'd love to end with this question. Has modern Amiga cheapened itself with movie franchises, with all the millions and millions of special uh, limited editions? How do you feel the brand is? Was it better then or are they better now? What is your opinion? Please do share down below. All right, guys, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to, to check out the Urban Gentry store. Each month there are new items, a limited run uh, designed by myself, of course. Uh, what else? Instagram, Facebook, all the rest of it. Please don't forget to add your thoughts, queries, comments, opinions, all the rest of it down below. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, guys, I will catch you in the next one. Oh, and happy hunting uh, if you're looking for something like this. Ciao.